our students sometimes tune us out during class. Do you agree? Are you frustrated they don't pay more attention to you during your lectures? Why do you suppose they're doing that? And what can we do to reduce that from happening? Do you think it takes too long to create professional looking presentations? Are you looking for quicker, more efficient ways to develop engaging presentations for your students? Hopefully you attended Tuesday's presentation where I walked through some tips and tricks for creating less boring presentations. Now, in this short podcast episode, I'd like to explain the science behind the tips and tricks I shared and hopefully create a discussion here in the comments because I'd like to know how this conversation with myself is going to land with you. Plus, I bet you all listeners here have better um, and maybe some additional tips and tricks for improving your lectures too. Let's get into the science, well, shall we? Perhaps you heard a little bit about a theory called the cognitive load theory. One of the famous researchers in this area is Dr. John Sweller. Among other things, this theory is useful for understanding the different types of attention for learning. There are four main types of attention. Let me explain each one and how it relates to learning. Dr. Sweller lists four types of attention as divided, focused, sustained, and selective. Divided attention is when students splits their attention between two tasks. This is not good attention when it comes to learning, as you might imagine. Focused attention, on the other hand, is great for learning if students' attention is focused on the right thing. Sustained attention is where students focus their attention for longer periods of time. And this can be very useful, but challenging to do when learning difficult or complex things. Lastly, there's selective attention where learners make their own decision, oftentimes, on what they give their attention to. It could be that they're only partially paying attention to something that's going on and they come in and out of focus based on what else might be getting their attention. Or it could be that they just have other things on their mind and can't get engaged in the first place. And so they're, they may not um, only be passing by in their attention onto what's happening in the class. Here's the challenge that we contend with as an educator when it comes to gaining, directing, and maintaining your students' attention. The brain is like a computer, right? Maybe many of you have heard this uh, comparison. This is not by accident that the brain is compared to the computer. And a, a very quick analogy here, the brain processes information by perceiving the information first through your senses, then storing the information in your short-term or working memory, and then storing that information for later retrieval on your long-term memory capacity. If we're lucky, we get to retrieve that information later. So this is a ridiculously short explanation for how the brain works. Many of you know this already, but why this cognitive, why it relates to this cognitive load theory and the different types of, of attention matters because if our students don't give attention to the right things that we want them to learn, there's no chance that they'll be able to retrieve things later on when we ask them to. Making this even more challenging, those instruments in our brain that help us with processing are very finicky in their own right. We may have multiple senses that compete with themselves in processing, perceiving and processing information. If we hear, it's called cognitive dissonance, where we may hear something at the same time, uh, see something. That's why we should never use the words word for word, read off our slides. One, it's monotonous and somewhat boring, but two is that our brain uh, cannot take input that is the same from multiple channels uh, of our senses. So then let's just say we do perceive something and then we start to process the information we tend to store things on what's called our working memory. This is a very important part of our brains. It's like a very small dinner plate that's gonna hold your food before you transfer it to your stomach. The working memory is a relatively small plate and can only hold so much at a time. 
And just like how your stomach is bigger than that smaller plate, uh, maybe not so for everyone, but for me, for sure, uh, when it comes to cookies, your working mem memory will send information to your long-term memory, which is your stomach in this, this analogy, this metaphor. And that has your stomach and your, your long-term memory have a big, much bigger, almost infinite capacity. This is how learning happens, right? So when you sit down for a meal, you have to be interested in that meal beforehand before you want to take, you, you load your plate up, perhaps. You eat from the smaller plate than what your stomach can hold. Your working memory does this little thing like you do with your peas, right? It separates things that are important. Ah, this seems important. Ah, this is going to taste bad. I hate broccoli, right? Just like uh, some of us who pick around to find the good stuff to eat. But once it does, your working memory does that, then when that happens at your working memory stage, then it's gonna send nutritious things to your stomach, just like your long-term uh, memory. This is how it goes, right? So real quick, I wanna review the four-step process that I covered in the presentation before today. It is super crucial that we pay attention to how we captivate guide and maintain our students' attention during our instructional activities. If you missed it, please check out that four-step process I outlined to help your students pay attention during your lectures. But to review, those steps are, first, create a theme to reduce cognitive load and your time. This will actually reduce time you need to create these engaging presentations following the demonstration that I showed you. Using a theme builder for Google Slides or a Slide Master for PowerPoint, you can create some awesome presentations. How many of you have had this situation where you're, you're sitting down, you've got your notes, you might even have an outline for your slides, or you inherited a slide deck, and you're going slide by slide trying to figure out ways to organize the information. Using a theme will accelerate this where typically you have bullet, bullet points on the left, image on the right, maybe you have a big image and you put bullet points over the top, whatever the case might be, this is gonna accelerate that because it's gonna reduce the need to create this original from scratch. Plus it's gonna reduce the cognitive load because things are gonna look uniform, things are gonna look organized, things are gonna look uh, like cohesive by using this theme to do so. The next step would be to capture your students' attention. To increase their focus, right, start every lecture with an intention to capture their attention right off the bat when they walk into your class. They need your help to focus on what you're about to tell them. One of the most easy ways to do that, and it's at your disposal, probably on your phone even, all over the internet, is the use of video. Multimedia, right? Multimedia is very effective for guiding people's uh, attention in this day and age, partly because of motion, movement, color, sound, there's all these different elements. And it's a little bit novel too. So many of our lectures are just text or at best image and text. So adding a video at the beginning of your class will create a novel effect that will gain your students' attention right away. That third step, is gonna be now that you have their attention, you're gonna to wanna to direct their attention. Novices don't know where and how to prioritize information yet. It's not that they can't in the future, but you need to help them by guiding their focus towards the things that are the most important. For instance, use less words on the screen. Only use enough detail to guide them to comprehend what it is that they should know. When you use a lot of words, they, it leaves room for them to misinterpret things. Again, cognitive dissonance where now they're reading while you're talking, missing your point or vice versa, right? And I know that a lot of our students ask for the PDFs and they want access to our slide decks, all of those things, fantastic. I'm not asking you to change that behavior where you put everything where your slides stand alone, but maybe consider abbreviating what's on the, the main part of your slides and sharing the notes view with the more detailed explanation so that 
they can only dip into that explanation when they need to. And then this last step is tell a story. We all love a good story, right? In our classes, most cases, we're giving a lot of facts, concepts, and procedures all wrapped up together to help our students be able to do something, know something, perform a certain thing that we want them to be able to do, right? That's a lot to keep track of. And if you think about a particular lecture, hour to hour, day to day, this can become overwhelming quickly. But I'll say, what would be more memorable to you? Who would you bet on? A student with a phenomenal memory to remember 20 facts or a person with maybe an average memory that can remember one story? Who would you count on being able to re repeat what it is that you told them two weeks from now? I hope you bet on the person with an average memory that got told a story because the science is pretty clear that stories are extremely effective for helping people not only learn, but to remember and retain and retrieve information later on in life, right? This is how history, human history gets transferred on and on and on over the centuries, right? Is the art of storytelling. There are three parts to storytelling, right? Say it with me, there's a beginning, there's an end, and there's a middle. In addition to those three parts of the story, it's important to uh, also connect it to why they should know this, right? Bringing up relevancy, those type of things, and always close with a call to action during your classes. What is it that you want them to do with the information that you just shared with them? And maybe you make it concise and clear and say, these are the three things I want you to do after today's conversation that we had. So that was a really quick explanation of the science behind what I showed you during the demonstration and the presentation. It looks like it's uh, my time to go here, but I really want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast episode about the science behind the four steps to create a less boring lecture. I don't think what I've shared is only applies to lectures, for the record. I think it can apply to all types of instruction, no matter the format or environment. Nonetheless, we have two more action-packed weeks of presentations and podcast episodes heading your way this month. Please tune in for those events. They only get better. And like I said at the top, I'd love to hear from you. Take a minute to let me know what you think of the ideas I shared, which one was your favorite, which one was your least favorite idea I shared in this episode. Use the comments below this podcast episode. And if you'd like to earn credit towards the Level Up Certificate Program, and I hope you all do, you're taking time to listen to this, you need to get the credit for it, please follow the link below that will let us know who you are so we can keep track of it for you, give you credit for listening today. All right, so please join me again, same time, same place to listen and learn from Dr. Julie Spear and Miss Brittany Williams about additional ways to engage your students by integrating educational technology. Until next time, ciao for now.